Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We're so thankful you're here. We have a good crowd this morning. We greatly appreciate you being here. Our objective, as always, is to worship God in spirit and in truth, what he expects us to do. And so we hope that everything we do this morning will be pleasing in his sight. And that's why we're here. But we're so grateful to see all of you this morning. And we hope that you'll come back and be with us again. So we want to mention just a couple of updates I have on the, on the uh, our continuing prayer list. Again, if you know of anything else that uh, I need to know, please let me know. And if I forget something, I do apologize. Uh, I hope I'll get it all. So um, Sister Jacqueline, she is, we talked about she was going to get a surgery scheduled. So she did go to the doctor this past week. So her surgery is scheduled uh, for a week from Thursday, so not this coming Thursday, but the next one. She'll be having that in Murfreesboro on her back. So she's got a lot of, a lot of problems there, and we're hoping that they can uh, at least help her somewhat, give her some relief, a lot of the pain that she's suffering through. So please pray for her that that surgery will go very well. Uh, we just added to the prayer list Troy Williams. This is Leona's brother. He does have prostate cancer. And he has a, a doctor's appointment Wednesday and to find out what surgery or whatever they need to do to uh, deal with that. So uh, please pray for him that this is something that they can fix and they can help him with. Uh, China Barrett, this is Jacqueline's niece. Uh, her father just passed away uh, recently and so she's, you know, Jacqueline's asked us to pray for China and her family as they go through this time of grief. So again, her name is China Barrett. We'll put her name up there. Um, Ron Swafford, this is a, a brother in Christ. That, does he go to Athens? or yes. Yeah, goes to Athens, Church of Christ. And so his mother uh, died this morning at NHC Healthcare in Athens. And so... Uh, Maurice has asked us to add him to the prayer list, Ron Swafford, to pray also for that family uh, as they deal with their time of grief as well. Uh, gospel meeting, there is an upcoming gospel meeting. I put it on the uh, bulletin board back there. Uh, Liberty Hill up in Englewood will be holding a gospel meeting November 10th through 12th. So this is kind of unusual, so that's a weekend. Normally a gospel meeting is Sunday through Wednesday. This one is Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Okay, so November 10th, that's a Friday. So Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, Jim Dearman will be doing the speaking. So Friday and Saturday nights at 7, and then Sunday is their regular uh, worship time. So they will be having a gospel meeting up there. All right, that's all I have. We're going to turn the song service over to Brother Cheryl, who will also, at the appropriate time, lead us in the opening prayer. Then Brother Lane will have our dismissal prayer. Morning, everyone. Morning, friend. Please get your song book and turn to number 249. Build your hopes on things eternal. 
Please turn to number 105. Let's sign this as part of the Lord's Supper.
Lord's Supper is a memorial of Jesus' death, which we are thankful to God the Father for his desire to send his Son to die on our behalf and for our sins. We have sorrow that it was for our sins that led to this sacrifice on Jesus' part. We acknowledge the fellowship of those partaking, and it is our desire that we partake of it in a worthy manner. I'm going to read Luke, the 22nd chapter, beginning verse 14 through 20. And when the hour was come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread, and he gave thanks, and break it, and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Let us pray. Father God, we come to your throne asking you to bless this bread that we're about to break. We thank you for this bread that we can have a symbol of the suffering that your son endured upon the cross. We thank you for that sacrifice of your son upon the cross. In his precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you for this fruit of the vine that we can have a symbol that you provided a symbol for us of the blood that was shed on the cross. We know that that blood was shed on our behalf that we can have hope of salvation if we follow your son's commandments. As we take this fruit of the vine, help us remember the suffering that your son endured upon the cross. In his precious name we pray. Amen. That concludes the Lord's Supper. It is a time that we give back to God for the many blessings that he's blessed us with. We know that all blessings come from God. I'm going to read 2 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, verse 7. Every man, according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or a necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Will you pray with me? Father God, again, we come to your throne, thanking you for life itself, especially the spiritual life that you give us through your Son. We thank you for this nation that we live in. We thank you for the nation that was based on the Bible. It's been brought down to us in this free country. We're so thankful of that. And we know that freedom is not free. We know that there are defenders of our faith and our freedom around the world at this time. And we give you thanks for that. We ask you to protect them as they protect us. We thank you for the material blessings that you've blessed us with through our efforts. We ask 
you to help us remember that we can help others. Help us to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's get you a song book and turn to number 350. Let's sign this before the lesson. again, I'll get my speaker turned on, welcome you all once again, so appreciate your presence so very much, it's encouraging to see a good crowd this morning, and thank you so much for being here. If you would be turning in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews chapter 4, that'll be the first one we're looking at here in a few moments, Hebrews chapter 4. In today's world, there's probably at least some, maybe a lot of confusion regarding the topic of temptation. What is temptation, especially when we compare it to sin? Are temptation and sin, are they the same thing? Well, the short answer is no. And before you say, good, can we go home now? No, you know I'm going to give you the long answer. But the short answer is no, they are not the same. Temptation and sin are, are two different things. We realize they are connected, but they are two different things. Well, how do we know that? Well, as always, we want to go to the Bible to find our answers to any spiritual question. That's where we need to go. The opinion of man, mine, or anybody else's really doesn't matter. We need to know what does the Bible say about this? And so really, all we have to look at to understand that temptation and sin are not the same thing is just look at the example of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, in Matthew chapter 4, we're not going to go read all this, but in verses 1 through 11, 
we notice the very familiar account of Jesus goes into the wilderness to be tempted. And we know from what the Bible tells us that Jesus was tempted, and we're going to notice that in a few minutes. He was tempted, but did he sin? So take a look at Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. We're going to notice the answer to that question. Did Jesus sin, even though he was tempted? Hebrews 4 and 15. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in, notice all points, tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So that clearly answers the question. Jesus himself was tempted. He faced temptation, and yet Jesus committed no sin. And we want to notice that in, in all points again. That's an important thing to consider. Because the Bible tells us that there are three categories of sins, three types of sin. Any sin you can commit is going to fall under one of these three categories. And we see this in, in 1 John 2 and 16. We're going to go read that, but basically summarizing it, John tells us it's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. If you'll remember, Jesus, when he faced temptation, he had three temptations, each one falling under one of those three categories. And so as we saw in Hebrews 4.15, he was tempted in all points, like we are. So he faced temptation from every one of those categories, just like we do. So we can't, well, Jesus just doesn't understand, or he completely understands what we're going through, because he went through it. So Jesus was tempted in all these ways, and yet... He committed no sin, no sin whatsoever. So we can ascertain that there can be temptation without sin. That's a fact. There can be temptation without sin. However, there is pretty much no sin without first having temptation. So temptation leads to sin, okay? Uh, they do go together. Now, if you'll look at Romans 3 and 23, we know that everyone is tempted because we know that everyone has sinned. And, of course, we're not talking about infants, you know, children that, that pass away at a very young age before they reach accountability, or people that have mental defect and they're not responsible. We're talking about anybody that can make conscious choices. All those people have sinned. How do we know that? Well, Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned. And come short of the glory of God. <clears throat> Look at 1 John 1 and verse 8. This elaborates on this a little bit. So all have sinned. We can't say, well, I don't know about y'all, but I've not committed any sins. Well, that's a lie if I say that. 1 John 1 and verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We all know people who love to point the finger at everybody else well those people are a bunch of sinners out there you know but they never self-reflect never want to look at themselves but this tells us we are all sinners so if i claim that i am not a sinner while you all are then this is telling me that either i'm a liar or if i really do believe that then i'm deceiving myself maybe i've convinced myself that i'm not a sinner but god says that i am and if I say I'm not, then the truth is not in me. So we have all sinned, so therefore we've all faced temptation. And we, we notice that in Hebrews 4 and 15. So this morning we want to figure out, well, how does it, exactly does this work? What is the relationship between sin and temptation? So let's take a look at some facts, and we can ascertain the answer to this. So our primary scripture this morning is James chapter 1. We want to read verses 12 through 17. This is where we're going to focus our study. James chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. And we're going to notice in this passage some facts about temptation and sin. And hopefully we can clear some things up this morning. James chapter 1, beginning in verse 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. 
Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So let's look at some characteristics this morning of temptation. First of all, let's talk about the source of temptation. Where does it come from? What is the source of temptation? Well, again, if you look at verse 13, we get the answer to this. Because so many people, they want to blame God for their problems. God did this, or God did that, or God didn't do something for me. It's always God's fault they want to blame for their problems. And a lot of people probably want to blame temptation on him as well. But we see here in verse 13 again that you cannot say, I'm tempted of God. God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. The scriptures tell us, God does not tempt us. God is not responsible for the temptation that you and I face every day. So to blame him for that would be erroneous. Temptation doesn't come from God. So where does it come from? Well, we cannot point our finger at God, but we can point our finger somewhere and two places specifically. There are really two culprits here. Where does temptation come from? Well, one of them is me. I have to look at myself that I cave in to temptation. We have ourselves to blame. I don't need to be blaming God when I encounter temptation. Verse 14 tells us every man's tempted and when he's drawn away, notice of his own lust. Not that God put it there, but I'm drawn away of my own choice because God has given us free will choice. So that's, that's on me. That's not on God. Nobody's forcing me to make that choice. I've decided to make it. And then the other responsible party besides myself would be Satan. Temptation doesn't come from God. It comes from Satan. Turn over to Matthew 4. We mentioned that a minute ago, so we do want to read a couple of those verses. But Satan is the one who constantly places temptations in our path because he's trying to lure us or pull us away from God. That's what he wants to do. So look at Matthew 4, the first three verses. This is when Jesus was tempted. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be, notice, tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward in hunger. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. So we see here he's tempted by the devil. The devil's also called the tempter. We see that in other places. Take a look at 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 5. We see here a similar reference talking about Satan, the devil, that he is the tempter. Okay, so he is responsible for this. 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 5. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. Another reference to Satan, the devil, that he is the tempter. He is going to place obstacles in our path. Now, there are several people in here, probably, if you'll turn over to 1 Peter, Several of you are hunters or have hunted in the past. It's not something that I've ever done, but, but quite a few people have. And so you know, understand the, the hunting reference. Satan is like a hunter. It's what he's doing. He sets traps. He is stalking his prey. Now, who is Satan's prey? We are. Satan is hunting us. 
Okay? And consider this as well. The people who are non-Christians, the people that are not obeying the word of God, well, he's already got them. Now, that doesn't mean he's not still tempting them, but he's not going to spend, he didn't need to spend as much time on them. He spends most of his time on you and me. We are the ones he doesn't have. We are the ones he, wrote, he wants in his trophy case. Figuratively speaking, he wants my head on his wall and yours too. So he is like a hunter stalking his prey and we are the prey. 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So when we think about temptation, don't blame God. The fault lies with ourselves, what we do with it, and the fault lies with Satan. He is the tempter. He is the one that places this before us. So that is the source of temptation. What about the course of temptation? Well, how does it work exactly? We've noticed that temptation in and of itself is not a sin. A lot of people think that it is. Just to be tempted is a sin, but as we've noticed, Jesus was tempted. And he didn't sin. So clearly temptation by itself is not sinful. It, it's got to be fruitful. And well, how does that work exactly? Because temptation can and often does lead to sin. But it doesn't have to. And it didn't with Jesus. And it doesn't have to with you or me. We don't need to have that attitude. Well, there's nothing I can do about temptation. I just got to cave into it. Now, that's what the devil wants us to think. It doesn't have to lead to sin with me and you, but, but it can do that, and with a lot of people, it does. Now, what is temptation exactly? Well, this is having the thought or the desire to do something, say something that would be displeasing to God. Say or do something that would be a transgression of God's law. That, that's what temptation is, a, a thought, a desire, to do this now we must quickly dismiss those thoughts that we have in our head put them out of their head because we will get them that's guaranteed you, you can't stop sometimes bad thoughts from coming into your head they're going to come in there Satan's going to put these things before us but we've got to put those things out of our head because if we put them out that's how we can resist the temptation to act on it, which then cultivates into sin. So if we dwell on these negative thoughts, if we let these things consume us, if we obsess over these things, then that's what becomes sin. That's what grows into sin. Many times, those thoughts will lead to sinful actions. It will lead to sinful behavior, things that God does not approve of. So, for example, if you have someone who's struggling with alcohol and they want to drink, well, that's the temptation, wanting to drink. But if they don't ever take the drink, then that temptation in and of itself is not sinful. It's just the temptation. They want to have a drink. But dwelling on that constantly instead of trying to put those thoughts out of your mind that's what typically will lead to sooner or later you give in to that temptation and you engage in the sinful behavior of, of getting drunk all right so got to put those thoughts out of your head well let's take a look at another example which leads into kind of an interesting area when we think about this what about lust or adultery well, we think about if a man, for example, if a man sees a beautiful woman that is not his wife and has immoral thoughts about that woman, just having those thoughts initially, that's not sinful. That's the temptation. Okay? That the thought coming into your head is, is the temptation. Okay? If we quickly look away and we push those things out of our head. And we, we preached a while back, you know, David didn't do that. Right? When he saw Bathsheba, he dwelled on that, and then that led for him to do the things that he did 
with Bathsheba. So if David had, when his, as soon as he saw her, wow, she's a beautiful woman, but he said, oh, I, I can't do that. And he walked away and got something else on his mind, he would have been okay. Just having that initial thought would not be sinful, but David caved into it, and that's, that's where the problem is, okay? If we don't put those thoughts out of our mind, and this could be about anything, but that may lead to pursuing that woman, having an affair with that woman, which obviously that would be sinful. You've committed adultery against your spouse. Well, we want to consider something else. If you'll turn over to Matthew chapter 5, because we need to, this is where maybe some of the confusion comes in. And it's hard to know where exactly the line is. That's why I said you've got to put those things out of your mind. But we notice something else to consider on specifically on this topic of adultery, but it really would apply to any kind of temptation. Notice what Jesus said in Matthew 5 and 28. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So now wait a minute. So Jesus is saying if I just think about it, that I don't actually conduct the action it can still be sinful. That's what he said. Even thoughts that don't become action can become sinful if, again, we dwell on it. We, don't, we just let those thoughts fester in our mind. They stay in there. We're thinking about it all the time. That's what Jesus is talking about here. This is someone who obsesses over someone else. They may never actually even meet that person let alone, you know, commit the physical act of adultery. But Jesus is saying, if you're thinking about that all the time, you've already committed adultery because this is somebody that's not dismissing the thought and going on to other things. You're, you're, st you're lingering with it. And Jesus has said, well, even that, even though you don't commit the physical act, you've still sinned at that point because you're, you're letting those thoughts live rent-free in your house, in, in your brain, right? It's just staying there you got to get rid of those things. So when unrighteous thoughts creep in, and they will, that's guaranteed, they will, whether it's these kind of thoughts or anything else, stealing, drinking, whatever it is, those thoughts will creep in there. That's going to happen, but we must not let that grow into sin. Again, we've got to get our mind off of those things, put those thoughts out of our mind, it may be an anger issue, any sin you can think of, right? If you dwell on that, it's going to become sinful, even if it doesn't lead to action. But obviously the action, if it leads to action, that is sinful as well. So don't let it grow into sin. That is the course of how temptation leads into sin. Well, what about remorse? What happens... When we allow the temptation to turn into sin, either by obsessing over those thoughts or by actually acting on it, engaging in behavior, well, what happens then? Well, if you'll be turning in the old, toward the end of the Old Testament, the book of Habakkuk, we read here again in James that says, "You're drawn away of your own lust and enticed." Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. That's the consequences of sin. Well, what kind of death are we talking about? Now, sometimes sinful behavior does lead to physical death. There are times where you could get killed doing something that you shouldn't be doing. That's a possibility, but that's not what James is talking about here when he says sin leads to death. He's not saying, well, you're automatically going to physically die. He is talking about spiritual death. Sin leads to spiritual death every single time. It may or may not cause physical death. Spiritual death, that's guaranteed. It will happen. It separates us from God because God will not accept sin. Look at Habakkuk 1 and verse 13. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. 
Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he? Habakkuk is telling God can't even stand to look on sin because God is holy. God doesn't even want to see it. He doesn't want to look at it. It disgusts him as well it should. It separates us from him. He will never accept it. Let's go back to the New Testament. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 12. We have a similar idea here. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 12. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. God doesn't want to look at it. He doesn't want to see it. He doesn't want to hear it. We've talked about before. We've had sermons on prayer. Will God hear the prayer of unrighteous people? The answer is no. He will not hear. But we also know the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. God doesn't want to be involved in sin at all. Well, look at Galatians 5 verses 19 through 21. Galatians chapter 5. We want to see some of these things that God classifies as sin and notice the consequences of engaging, either, again, obsessively thinking about it or actually doing it. Galatians 5, beginning in verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. Envying, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Those things separate us from God. Okay, because the good news is, if we are trying our best to obey God and we get to heaven to be with him, none of those things will be in heaven. Satan won't be there. There will be no more temptation. There will be no more sinful behaviors. It's going to be all fantastic then. And that's where we want to be. Because those things will separate us from God. So that's the remorse. Well, what about finally, is there any recourse to this? We, we know that we're all tempted. We know that we are all sinners which means that at least sometimes we give in to those temptations. We know that if we do give in to those temptations and it becomes sin, we know that will separate us from God. Well, is that a permanent separation? Well, it can be. But the good news is it doesn't have to be. There is good news here. God is the remedy for the sins that we commit, the sin that emerges out of the temptations that we face. God is the remedy. Christ is the answer. God loves us. He really does. And he doesn't want any of us to be separated from him, which he plainly tells us that's what sin does. That's why he doesn't want us to commit sin, because it will pull us away from him. That's not what he wants. Look at 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. How many people does God want to be saved? Everybody. Everybody in this room, everybody out there. We know, unfortunately, that's not going to happen. But that's not because God doesn't want it. God wants all men to be saved. So God knows that even after we become a Christian, even after we've been baptized into Christ, that washed away all of our sins up to that point. But what if we sin after that? Because we probably will. And God knows that. He's not stupid. right? God knows that we will still sin. Although it should be, if we're true Christians, it should be a lot less frequently that we do that. It should not be a habitual all the time thing. So it ought to be less frequent, but there's no guarantee that it's, it's not going to happen. 
It's going to be there. Well, God knows that. So he has provided us with a path back to him. If we cave into sin, God still wants us to be saved. God knows that we are separated from him, but he wants us to come back. He wants us to be reunited. He's given us a way to do that because he's a loving God. Acts 8 and 22. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness and pray, God, and perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. This was told to Simon the sorcerer who wanted to buy the gifts, the, the miraculous powers that the apostles had. So see, again, his sin was in his thought. He didn't actually do it because the apostles weren't going to sell it to him. But that was in his heart. He really wanted to do it. If they'd been willing to sell it to him, he would have bought it. So he was willing to do that. So that became sin for him. And he was a Christian. He'd already been baptized. So he's told there, repent and pray that God will forgive you. Well, look at 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. 1 John 1, verse 9. Notice if we do that, if we take this path back to God, notice what happens. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the good news, right? So, yes, God knows the temptations that you and I face. Yes, God knows that from time to time we may give in to that and it may grow into sin. But God doesn't cut us off the first time we sin against him. Nope, that's it, you're done, that's it. He doesn't do that. He wants us to come back. So he's told us if we will confess those sins, repent for them, pray to him for forgiveness, he will forgive us. And once again, the blood of Jesus will continually cleanse us if we're willing to take those steps. Because God does not want us to be separated from him. So all of us face temptation from Satan, not from God. But remember this, we've often talked about it. Satan cannot force you and me to do anything. Okay? If I do it, it's because I did it. Not because I can't tell the well, you know, that's the devil's fault. No, well, he tempted me, but I'm the one that caved into it. So he can't force us to do anything. He does have the power to tempt us. He does not have the power to force us to commit sin against our will. If we sin, it's because we willfully chose to do that against God. So being tempted is not a sin, but either dwelling on that thought or acting on it, that is a sin. So may God help us to resist the temptations of Satan because we are going to face them every day. May God help us to resist that so that we don't sin against him. And when we do stumble, because we will from time to time, may we have a humble heart. May we be willing to confess, willing to repent. May we be willing to pray to God and ask him for forgiveness because we know if we'll do those things, we'll get the forgiveness that God so desperately wants to give us. This morning, are you a Christian? If you're not a Christian, then that means, like we just said, you are separated from God. Your sins have separated you from God because God commands everyone to be a Christian, a child of his, a follower of his. And that means we strive to put that sinful life away. If you're not a Christian this morning, you need to follow God's plan of salvation, which is five simple steps. Hear the word, which you've heard this morning. Believe the word. That, yeah, I believe the Bible is God's word. Repent of your sins. That's a complete change of lifestyle. I'm, I'm trying my best not to do those things again. Confess. Make a public confession that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You believe that. And then finally, step five, is to be immersed in the watery grave of baptism. And that's what symbolically washes away your sins. There's no magic in the water. It's just water. But the magic is in the obedience. That's the power of God. When you obey, your sins will be cleansed 
and you will come up out of that water as a Christian. God will add you to his true church. Nobody can get to heaven without doing that. I don't care what the world tells you. I'm telling you what the Bible tells you. And you need to read it for yourself and check. Don't take my word for it. It's there. Read it. You do those things, you're a child of God. So if you've not done that, we can help you with that this morning. If you are a child of God, but you've had sin in your life, you've caved in to one temptation or another, maybe multiple, whatever, you've been, again, separated from your God. That's what sin does. Temptation doesn't do it, but sin does. If you've got sin in your life that you need to repent for, we've laid it out. God said, confess those sins, repent for them, pray to him for forgiveness, and he'll forgive you. And again, those sins will be cleansed because we still have the blood of Jesus, which we came into contact with when we were baptized. God wants you to come back. So if you have a need this morning to become a child of his, or if you have a need to be restored to him, Please come forward as together we stand and we sing. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing fire? Are you washing the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed? In the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb, are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest Moment in the crucified, are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Pure and white in the blood of the Lamb, will your soul be ready for the mansion of Christ and be washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood? In the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb, are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Thank you for being here this morning. We hope to see you tonight at 6 o'clock. Well, I want to thank you tonight, Brother Mark, for a good lesson and a true lesson. We all need to abide. Some of these days, we're going to have to ask you. There's only one way. Please, everyone, keep those that are sick and have hardship in their lives in your prayers. Please pray for our church. Pray for our community. Pray for this old ball, our ball of dirt we live on called earth. It's in turmoil right now. And we, we really need to pray for peace. Always remember, like he said, services tonight at 6 o'clock. Services on Wednesday night at 6 o'clock. 
Bible study, Sunday morning at 9 30, Sunday services at 10 30. And again, uh, next Sunday night at 6 o'clock. Please turn your songbook to number 587. Let's sing the first verse of this and we'll have our closing prize. <clears throat> It's so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to thank Him at His word, just to rest upon His promise, just to know the same love. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I prove Him more and more. Go with us. 